one. You have 30 seconds to read questions one to six. Well, Piers, our first semester at university is almost over. I can't wait for the holiday. Me too. Why don't we go somewhere far away and forget about lectures and essays and all that hard work? Sounds good. Now, how long will we have before we have to be back here on campus for the next semester? We've got about six weeks, I think. How about if we go to the coast? It would be great to do some swimming and surfing. The coast would be good, but let's look at our other options. There are some mountains. They're nice and cool at this time of year. And we can do some bushwalking. There's also the desert, which I really enjoyed last year. What about going to Sydney? I've never been there, and they say it's a great city to visit. Lots of things to do there, I've heard. I agree Sydney would be good, but there are too many tourists at this time of year. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 7 to 10. And I'd rather get away from buildings and cars. There are enough of those around here. I vote for the mountains. Well, for places to stay, there are the usual places. Motels, hotels, youth hostels. You can go camping too. I'm afraid I'm not a very good camper, Anna. I tend to feel a bit frightened sleeping outdoors. And the hassle of building fires and all the insects and... All right, all right. We'll forget about camping. Although I must admit it would have been my first choice. So what should we do? Well, since neither of us has a lot of money, I don't think a hotel or motel would be possible. How about a youth hostel? I'd rather not go to a youth hostel, Piers. They are certainly cheap, but you never get to be alone in those places. There's always a stranger in the next bed. And I hate sharing a kitchen with people I don't know. No, I think we should find a small holiday house to rent. And if we get a few more friends to join us, it'll be really cheap. I think your idea is spot on. But who should we ask? How about Lucy? Do you think she would want to join us? I was just talking to her this morning. And she said she was flying home to Taiwan for a visit. Oh, well, what about Jim and his girlfriend Nancy? Oh, and David Hong might be interested. And his brother Walter is studying here too. We could ask him. Hang on, not so fast, please. I'm writing a list of people to ring. Let me think. We could ask Jennifer too. I don't think she has any plans. And Michael Sullivan. I think I'll just ring them all now. After ringing their friends, Anna returns to speak to Piers. Well, I talked to everyone we thought of. A few of them are quite keen, actually. Tell me, what did they say? Well, Jennifer can't make it. She's already booked a flight to Queensland. She said she was going to meet her boyfriend up there. I also talked to David Hong. He said he would come. He said he was really looking forward to getting off campus too. What about his brother, Walter? His brother is going overseas. In fact, he is not even coming back next term. It seems he has transferred to a university in Canada. Uh, I then called Jim's house. His girlfriend Nancy answered. I told her our plans and she asked Jim. They both wanted to join us. Good. They'll be fun to be with. Now, what about Michael Sullivan? Did you talk to him? Yes, but he said he'd rather spend his holiday at home. He's not interested in going anywhere. Can you imagine? Later, Piers and Anna are talking while Anna fills out a holiday house rental form. The form asks for home address. I've put mine. 52 Miller Street. But let me see if I've got yours right. It's 614 Valentine Street, isn't it? You've got the street number right, but not the name. It's 614... Ballantine Street. That's B A L L A N 
T Y N E. Okay, we're paying by credit card. Is that all right? That's fine. Have you got a Visa card or a Mastercard? And I need to know the number, of course. Sure, it's seven seven four three two one two nine. But it's not a Visa or Mastercard. It's an American Express. Let me just repeat that. It's seven seven four three two one two nine. American Express, right? That's right. One more thing we have to write down. That's the deposit we're paying to reserve the holiday house. It says it should be at least ten percent of the rental cost. Let's just figure that out now. Uh, we're paying three hundred and fifty dollars a week, right? Right, and we're planning to stay there for five weeks. So the deposit is what? Should we say two hundred and twenty-five dollars? No, that can't be right. I'd say it's less than that. In fact, about fifty dollars less. It should be one hundred and seventy-five dollars. Hmm. I guess you're right. Okay, that's what I'll put down. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a lecture. Before you listen, you have thirty seconds to read questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen to the lecture. And answer questions. Questions eleven to fifteen. Could everybody hear me? Is the microphone working? Good. Now, welcome everybody to the second of these lectures on successful study at college. Yesterday, we were talking about housekeeping issues, where to find information, how to use library computer system, and so on. Today, we look at time management. And those of you who are interested in doing some extra reading on the subject are very welcome to see me after the lecture, as I have a booklet here. Now, time management. In the past, this was mainly used to make lists, so as to plan for every hour of the week, and then try to stick to the plan. These days, however, the whole idea of managing time has changed. It's impossible to manage time. To manage time, you need a clear idea of both what you want to achieve and how to achieve it. Also, you need to set goals, need to move towards achieving those goals in effective and systematic way. In this subject, in this college, our course goes mid-semester, and at the end of the semester, usually involves two written assignments of between fifteen hundred and three thousand words in length. If you work weeks of the term, everyone looks cheerful and focused. Followed by week six, assignment time, people start to look a lot stressed. The library reports the increasing number of students who become angry when books are not available. So what has happened? Has everybody become irritable and angry for no reason? Why? The reason is the people have not managed time well. They have not set priorities for reaching their goals. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have thirty seconds to read questions sixteen to twenty. And as a result, some of them would do badly in their assignment. This will not be because they lack intelligence or love of the subject. They will fail because they did not have a clearer idea of what they have to do and how long it would take them. Let's step back a minute. What does it mean by establishing goals? Basically, 
it means deciding on what you want to achieve. In other words, deciding on the results that you want to achieve. All the students that I mentioned before who found themselves very stressed they had an assignment to do, but they did not fully think through the effect that this would have on their day-to-day -day life. There's an awful lot of spare time in a day. Just think of a moment of all the time that you have badly today. For example, if you had managed to spend some of it, even just one hour on an activity that would have helped you with your study, that one hour could have a major impact on your course, particularly if you make it a regular habit. I'm asking you now to have a look at the planners in your information kits. You will see that there are three, one term planner, one weekly planner, one daily planner. The term planner is to help you get an overview of everything that you will need to do for the term. The weekly planner is to help you week by week and the daily planner will help you with detailed planning. Before we go any further, now, I would like you to make a note in your daily planner. I want you to picture how you can make a major difference in your life by spending just one hour a day in some activity for the next term. Background reading, for example, or preparing a bibliography. Now, imagine at the end of term, the term diary and weekly diary are the most important ones. However, a week is really the shortest time you can have to set an overview of your time. Now, you need to set priorities for the term. Look out how you could achieve those priorities and the result that you desire. If you can get into the habit of planning like this, you'll soon find that you have actually had more time to spend on relaxation and other activities you enjoy. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation. Before you listen, please look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. Hi, Rita. Come on, how are you? Fine, thank you. Hello, Jane. How are things? OK. Well, as I explained on the phone, I'm a counsellor here at the Student Services section of the university and I'm interviewing overseas students to help me draw up a guide for new students. So I'd be grateful if you could tell me a little about your time since you've been here in Cambridge. Right. Good idea. Now, Rita, let's start with you. OK, um, this is your second semester, isn't it? Could you tell us something about your first impression of the town when you arrived? Yeah, well, first of all, I was struck by how quiet it is here in the evening. Yes, I suppose Cambridge is a quiet place. Where did you live when you first arrived? Well, I went straight into student accommodation. It was kind of a student hostel. All right, so you didn't have to worry about doing your own cooking or anything like that? No, but sometimes I wished I had. Food at the hostel was awful. Oh dear. But how were the other students? To be honest, I haven't managed to make friends, even though the place is full. People seem to keep to themselves. They're not really very friendly. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, what about the actual course? You're studying... Um, I'm doing a master's course in environmental studies. All right. And how are you finding that? Yeah, well, it's been pretty good, really. I've enjoyed the course, but I feel there hasn't been enough contact with the lecturers. They all seem to be incredibly busy. The only chance I've really had to talk to them was on the field trip. Well, that's no good. Could anything be done to improve the course, in your opinion? Well, 
I think it would be helpful to have a meeting with the lecturers on the course. Say, once a fortnight, something like that. Regular meetings. Yes, that could certainly help. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions. Now, Rita, we'll come back to you in a minute, but I'd like to ask Jane some questions. Jane, where are you from? I'm from Indonesia. And how did you find Cambridge when you first arrived? Well, I like it here. I think the city is very beautiful. What about your accommodation? Was that OK? Yes, OK. At first, I stayed with a family for three months. They were very kind to me, but they had three young children, and I found it difficult to study. Right, I see. So, after three months, I moved out and now I live with two other students in a student house. It's much cheaper and we like it there. Good. And what about your studies? What are you studying? I'm doing a Bachelor of Computing. Computing. I see. Um, apart from the language difficulties, if you can separate them, how have you found the course? OK, but... Yes, go on. Well, the main difficulty for me is getting time on the computers in the computer room. It's always busy, and this makes it very hard to do my practical work. Yes, I'm sure that it would. Can you reserve time in the computer room? No, you can't, but it would certainly help if we could reserve computer time. Yes, I'll look into that and see if something can be done to improve things over there. Now, let's go back to Rita. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Questions 31 to 40 are based on the lecture. Before you listen, please look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. The peregrine falcon, Falco peregrinus, is a majestic prey bird with slate blue upper part and cream coloured underpart. Its underpart is distinguished by horizontal black barring and spotting. The peregrine's elegant head pattern makes this species very distinctive even from distance. Male peregrines weigh an average of 611 grams and females 952 grams. And female falcons hatch eggs, while male falcons spend most of their life in looking for food. The peregrine is a powerful, streamlined bird. But in the early days of research, experts did much on the flying height. It is generally believed that peregrines are capable of soaring to heights of 600 meters. At present, there is still a strong controversy among the scientists about how fast they can fly. Peregrine falcons are expert hunters feeding on songbirds, shorebirds, waterfowl, seabirds and pigeons, all of which are caught in flight. The peregrine is anatomically specialised for hunting by direct pursuit in open area. The prey often tries to escape by gaining altitude, but the peregrine uses its speed to stay above the prey and then dives killing the prey by a direct blow of the closed fist. In addition to speed, the peregrine may use the element of surprise, swooping from the direction of the sun or suddenly appearing from behind a cliff 
or around the corner of one of our skyscrapers. In the breeding season, falcons nest on a cliff ledge. Cliff top or ledge or top of the tallest building is also preferred, preying on pigeons in nearby parks. Occasionally, peregrines may nest on the ground. Females lay two to five eggs in the scrape or nesting site, which is usually just a shallow depression. Eggs are incubated for 32 days, mainly by the female, while the male hunts for food. The young start to fly at about two weeks after hatching, but remain dependent on the adults and not full grown until four weeks after birth. When they are four months old, they are able to hunt on their own, leaving their parents. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions. There are three subspecies of the peregrine falcon in Canada. The Arctic peregrine falcon, Falco peregrinus tundrius, occurs across the wide arc of tundra from the Mackenzie Delt to Hudson Bay and Ongava and north to Baffin Island. This subspecies is listed as vulnerable. The Pili peregrine falcon is non-migratory and inhabits the Queen Charlotte Islands and Moore Island, British Columbia. The Pili peregrine is listed as vulnerable within Canada. Most of the southern Canadian breeding populations are on the Anatum subspecies, which is a Canadian endangered species. The peregrine falcon once bred throughout Canada. However, its range has become much more restricted in recent years as populations have undergone declines, while peregrines rarely breed before three years of age. Facing such a situation, more scientists start the work on health conditions of peregrines. Recently, a group of experts in Toronto carried out an experiment on the child peregrines. First, they caught the sample child birds, then they attached identification on chicks' legs and foot rings and confirmed the sex. Subsequently, took the blood sample for further examination. Integrating all these data, they would be able to examine the general health conditions of the birds. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.